COVID-19 continues to take its toll on people and the economy. Lockdowns come and go, borders close and reopen, and the new Omicron variants creating more uncertainty. So, how can we deal with the economic implications of an open-ended pandemic? This is Inside Story. Hello, I'm Kamal Santa Maria. It was March 11th of 2020, a year and nine months ago, give or take a few days, when the word pandemic essentially took over our lives. And really, can we say there's an end in sight? COVID-19 infections are rising again and health officials are urging countries to speed up their vaccination drives to contain new outbreaks and the spread of more dangerous mutations. It is not a great picture. And what 2020 taught us is that the global economy cannot afford to take, again, the kind of hits it took last year. Now, the International Monetary Fund says the economy is expected to recover, even as the pandemic resurges. But the speed of the recovery, that is tied to strong policy changes, not just by individual countries, but at multilateral levels. The uncertainty means predictions can change at any time, of course, which ends up affecting future investments. And while everyday people hold on to their savings... So markets keep climbing, despite all of that real-world trouble. The impact of the pandemic has hit economies differently, but some effects have been felt, well, pretty much the same in all countries. Millions of people losing their jobs when businesses were forced to close during the initial wave of the pandemic. Global supply chains still severely disrupted as a result of staff shortages. Many ports are clogged with shipments, causing supply shortfalls and rising prices. And the International Monetary Fund predicts the cost of the basics, food and gas, will rise 4.3% this year, the biggest jump we've seen since 2011. Well, we can't solve all the world's problems, but we can talk about them with our three guests, starting in Johannesburg with Lorenzo Fioramonti, who is a professor of political economy at the University of Pretoria and the founding director at the Centre for the Study of Governance Innovation. In London, Vicky Price, Chief Economic Advisor at the CEBR, the Centre for Economics and Business Research, and a former UK government advisor. And in Shizuoka, we have Sujiro Takashita, who is the Dean of the School of Management at the University of Shizuoka. And I thank all three of you for joining us today. As I say, I don't think we're going to solve everything, but we can maybe figure out which sort of direction we're going in. Lorenzo, I'd like to start with you, primarily because of your title. You look at political economy, and I've always thought of this pandemic, certainly the reactions to this pandemic, as being almost politics versus economics, political decisions versus economic ones. Has that been the problem? But it's a problem with everything. It's all been politicised. Well, I think the politicisation of the pandemic is, is becoming more and more evident. And I think mostly in the second phase, in the second year. At the beginning, we were taken we were by surprise. You know, no one knew exactly what to do. But what is surprising is that after two years of having lived with uh, the buyers and having a global economy, having global institutions, we're still acting as if it was the first day. Mm. Look what happened after South Africa discovered the variant. You know, the whole world panicked. They closed down flights. There were no global institutions that uh, you know that 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 initiated that. It was a unilateral move by some countries without even making a phone call, without even coordinating on the most basics, and having an, an enormous and negative impact on the economy, and probably for no reason. So why did they do it? Okay, you've just yeah. said you've just said for no reason. But why do, is it just knee-jerk reactions? Is it is it is it? Uh, almost nationalism and protectionism, where countries said, whoa, we just got to shut down, we got to lock it down. I think so. I think it's a knee-jerk reaction. It's a lot of amateurism. Um, it's the fact that perhaps we have to realize we don't really have a system of global governance that is in place. I think no one takes the World Health Organization seriously. Um, governments do what they what they feel, you know, what they feel is right. They don't even listen to science anymore. You know, scientists have said from the very beginning, well, hold on, this variant may actually not be so severe. It may actually be a good news because maybe we have a new dominant virus, which it brings about a much um, milder disease, right? So that's what you want. You want to turn a pandemic into an epidemic. That's, sorry, into an endemic. That's what we said from the very beginning. And yet governments acted motivated by panic. I don't think there is a conspiracy behind that. But that is even more scary that we are 
globally run as if we didn't really have a global institutional system. Well, Vicky Price, in London, you used to advise the UK government. What, how did you feel that, and I don't know if you were doing this during the pandemic itself, but, you know, was the government really listening to uh, the advice and the potential outcomes of, of lockdowns and other such uh, border closures? Well, the interesting thing in the UK, certainly, is that the scientists were calling for tighter measures a little bit before the, the sort of Omicron var variants impact um, was properly calculated. So there had been this concern that things were getting slightly worse, that cases would be picking up in the winter. Uh, and there had already been, of course, some increased travel restrictions that were coming along in, in addition to what we've seen more recently, which is go back to working from home as much as you possibly can and the discussions that we're having about COVID passports and so on. So um, I would suggest that in this case, the politicians here would say we have been listening to the science, even though, as has just been said, maybe the Omicron variant isn't as dangerous as people had thought in terms of its impact, even though it's obviously spreading a lot. But mm. what has been happening because of the concerns that were already surfacing in various areas, so we had seen in Europe, certainly the Netherlands and, and other countries tightening up quite significantly. We saw that in Austria with a new lockdown. Um, the economic situation is obviously looking a little bit weaker. And most forecasters were already revising their expectations both for 2021 and for 2022 downwards, mm. even before the latest worries surfaced in a yeah. sort of serious way. You, so we're getting there in any case. You would hope, though, Vicky, we have moved past mass lockdowns, harsh lockdowns, wouldn't you? I was listening to um, Vivek Murthy the other day, the, the US Surgeon General, he was saying, you know, that was our only weapon in 2020 at the start of the pandemic. That's all we had. We locked down. Now... We've got, obviously, vaccines and we've got, hopefully, experience. We should move past those, right? Especially having seen the economic impact. Well, it's absolutely true that, of course, I mean, the vaccines have been very significant and uh, uh, the fact that now everyone is trying to get a, a, a third booster as well, and that's been happening also across Europe, uh, is, is a real positive step. Uh, nevertheless, I think what governments are doing is using right now, just thinking about politics a little bit, mm. the threat of closures and passports as a way to encourage all the unvaccinated to get vaccinated and those who have not had their boosters to do so as quickly as possible by reducing the date, the, the age at which you start having the boosters mm -hmm. uh, you know, initiated, which is what's going on right now. So it's going back to all the adults, not just those over 50 or 60 or those over 40 that we saw now. Uh, the, the target here is every adult should be asked to have a booster by the end of this month, mm. uh, which is December. So, I mean, that's a big, big issue, really, because um, what it means is that, indeed, if you do get those boosters, then, as you suggested, those lockdowns make very little sense. Mm. Let's bring Sajiro Takashita into our conversation. A view from Asia there. I actually haven't heard an awful lot about the situation in Japan recently. It was all in the headlines, obviously, leading up to and during the uh, postponed Olympic Games. Uh, how are things there now? Well, it has simmered down quite considerably. If you look at the, uh, the amount of number of people who are contracted with COVID-19, it's well under 50 per day. Huh. So we're doing a very good job here. But the negative implication that's been caused on the economic side, we all know that, uh, you know, the interest rates tend to get depressed uh, compared to the natural rate by approximately 0.5 to 1.5 percent over a span of well over 10, 20 years, meaning that there will be a continuous spread of inequality which is what you know a lot of people talk about, but particularly in Japan, which is a very much of egalitarian society. Um, so basically, uh, amongst the OECD nations, Japan has a very low amount of gap of uh, inequality. But that said, people are extremely sensitive about this. So this also connects not only to the economic side, but the political motives. And uh, you know, I think there was a very good imp uh, expression that was. Um, uh, said by the gentleman about, you know, government being motivated by the COVID-19, but we're getting a quite a lot of policy changes that are being enhanced, which obviously affect the economy. Um, 
And it's not only that, uh, there's also a vast change of uh, a distribution chain that's taking place right now, mm. basically due to the fact that we're getting a big war of hegemony between the United States and China and Japan, obviously being, you know, swirled into this. Mm. Uh, so you know, Kent, let, let me interrupt you just quickly, Sadhu. Seeing as mm. you've brought up the issue of, of, of supply chains and, and, and the like, this has been a, a, a product of the pandemic. People got laid off, yeah. couldn't keep up with the work. Now the demand is picking up. Now you're getting ships stuck out there because there's not enough people to do all the work. Has, is there a bigger lesson? Has there been a bigger lesson learned here about how we do business, about how we trade, about how we ship? I know we're a very interconnected world, but stuff still has to get from A to B physically? Well, the answer is yes and no. Yes, we have <laughs> started to introduce, you know, um, and thrown away the old status quo of methodology in doing business. But at the same time, again, this COVID-19 has basically given a lot of wake-up call, in particular to the, uh, I would say, nations that have been always already alarmed by the aggression uh, by the Chinese. Mm. So basically, people are walking away from just-in-time system to just-in-case system, from JIT into JIC, which theoretically might, might sound very good because people want to prepare for you know issues like you know COVID-19. But from the economic theoretical point of view, that's suicide. You mm -hmm. want to increase your inventory when your demand is unclear, but. Again, the geopolitical factor is winning out the economic factors because obviously we all understand the threat uh, that that has been displayed by the Chinese government. So obviously we're seeing this COVID-19 issue having a very big indirect impact on the geopolitical side, which directly impacts our supply chain, which directly impacts our economic situation. Oh, and then let's throw something else. So I'll just direct this to all three of you and then come to you one by one, inflation. I mean, Joe Biden has admitted and said this is a problem. He thinks it will start to come down quickly, but it's 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 a scary prospect, isn't it? Lorenzo, I'll start with you. When your basics start to come, move out of reach, your food uh, and, and your petrol and the like. Absolutely. And there was, uh, for some time, you know, there was this idea that inflation was temporary, and, um, you know, like even the European Central Bank, for instance, you know, like assumed that it was a temporary change in what believed to be a low inflation scenario. Now we understand that this is not going to be the case. Inflation is back. It's back for many different reasons. One of them is mostly, you know, like commodity prices, energy prices and so on and so forth. Um, but I think, again... You know, uh, what we're seeing is a, a perfect storm, potentially a perfect storm, you know, like of inflation rising and economic depression at the same time. That's why in this at this point in time, after two years of a an unprecedented pandemic, pandemic in our generation, mm. you would have expected governments to have learned a lesson. What um, the previous speaker was saying is extremely important. You can't do business when you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. After what happened with Omicron, and I keep saying this, not only because I'm based in South Africa, because mm. I've seen how little thinking went into it. Mm. Now, business people all over the world are going to probably think, what's going to happen if there's a new variant? Are we mm. going to see this again? Are we going to this, this, see this erratic behavior again? While well, they would expect of course, you know, the global governance system to work, you know, there, there will be variants, there will be mutations, so maybe in two years time, there's going to be another virus, what are we going to do? Are we going to shut down the planet every time? <laughs> what would you, you would expect is to see governance institutions step in and say, hold on, guys, we do have protocols, we do have technologies, we now have systems, we're a mature society, we're not led by you know, like sentiments. We're not mm. led by gut feelings. And this is precisely what is not happening. So my hope is that we have learned the lesson now and that the flight ban, the travel ban is relieved, immediately lifted. And also that we learn that in a complex world, you need to have a functioning global governance system to operate. And you cannot just simply go back to inward looking nationalism because mm. when that happens, then we expect it to happen again. And economics is all about perceptions. If perceptions are negative, that's what, what you're going to get. OK, uh, Vicky, I, I, I like what Lorenzo is saying, uh, the idea that we have to look at this, obviously, as a much bigger picture and, and a global picture. The problem, though, I see with quote-unquote global governance is that, and this is really simplistic, but everyone's different. All these 200 or so countries in the world are very different. They have very different needs. And there is this 
protectionism. I mentioned it before, this nationalism, which says, no, we've got to look after our own first. Now, that's understandable. How do you, how do you get global governance in past that sort of thinking? Well, the interesting thing is, though, that if you look at what each of the big countries have done, the, the ones in the West, they put huge amounts of money into the economy. And in an interesting way, for me, it facilitated trade to operate in you know, almost near normal. So what, what the WTO, the World Trade Organization, thought was going to happen in 2020 was that we might see a drop, as they thought at the time, of between 13 and 32 percent, if I remember correctly, in world trade. In fact, that fall was much less. It was about 5 percent. And what we're seeing in 2021 is a huge increase in trade that has taken place, which has kept quite a lot of nations going. So first of all, there was this huge input of fiscal stimulus that we saw uh, happening. Second, mm. we had big monetary injection in many countries, which then, of course, uh, you know, helped hugely with demand as it started developing again. And I think that has helped quite a lot of countries which have benefited from high commodity prices uh, in terms of if that was the export that they were involved in mostly, so they did reasonably well. Of course, you've seen oil prices go up and so on, but that has been because this extra stimulus and money that was put into the world economy, if you like, mm. um, led to demand being really rather strong and supply not being able to respond. So before we become too depressed, the reality is that, of course, we've had inflation high because of those circumstances when you suddenly increase demand without supply being able to respond that's where you'd get to yeah. but also if you look at the forecast for world growth for next year mm. they're still pretty positive we're not talking about depression here we're talking about still very substantial growth which will have made up actually for the fall of uh, 2020, yeah, by the actually, end of 2022. Seeing as you mentioned that, I've got IMF numbers here from uh, their projection in October where they were talking about uh, global growth this year of almost 6%, almost 5% next year, all up from minus 3% in 2020. So uh, all of that, maybe you can just explain for our viewers, is that A, good, and B, sustainable? That's the important thing, because you've talked about lots of money being pumped into the system, Vicky, which is great, but you can't keep doing that. And that's absolutely true. And that's exactly what's going on right now. For example, the US is reducing the, the amount of bonds it's buying back in, from the market every year. If you remember, it's been something like $120 billion uh, worth of bonds it's been buying since about March 2020 every month. I mean, this is a huge amount. And it's reducing that now. It started doing so from November, uh, that it's reducing that by about 15% billion a month. So by the middle of next year, it's not going to be buying anything anymore. Now that may change a little bit uh, if the economy slows down. But what we have seen is indeed there is a little bit of withdrawal of monetary support taking place right now. But also at the same time, what is happening um, is that they are looking again at maybe not increasing interest rates anything like as fast as they would have done otherwise. So yeah. we're not talking about things really tightening hugely. We're talking about the, the, the central banks being much more careful right now in terms of what they perceive the economy might be doing in the future and being, therefore, once again there to make sure the economies do not suddenly get into that depression that perhaps some people fear may happen. In other words, sort of stagflation, which mm. nobody likes. But yeah. I think the monetary authorities and the fiscal authorities seem to be quite prepared to stand around for a little bit longer and watch this space, if you like, and act if necessary. Sajiro is nodding there in uh, Shizuoka. Do you want to jump in? Well, yes, I think um, if I may add one more thing, I think the international coordinations, uh, you know, amongst the central banks have been become a lot more eloquent than, let's say, a decade or two ago. So obviously we can have uh, the mutual, I would say, uh, uh, cooperativeness that could kick in. Uh, and also, we must have that, considering the fact that, you know, most of these advanced nations have really swelled up on their debt. So, obviously, to sustain uh, calamity, or I should say calmness within the uh, financial market is a must, particularly for countries like Japan, where, you know, our debt to GDP is well over 200 percent and our demographics clearly showing that our birth rate is only 1.34 and the fact that, you know, uh, our senior citizen is going to have 
a majority in in 2025. Yeah. Uh, obviously, you know, the rise of interest rate would be an Armageddon scenario. And certainly it's not only for Japan, but the rest of the world as well, yeah. especially under the situation where we're talking about a lot of spending, but not where the money is coming from. Mm. As I look at all three of you here, I've just has reminded me the fact that you're all at home. You're all either in a living room or a home study and you're on Skype or Zoom. This has obviously been one of the big changes that we've seen in the last uh, year and a half. Um, I wonder if I could get just from each of you, and Lorenzo, I'll start with you, just a, 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 a view from your part of the world of changes. Did people stay at home? Have they, I feel people have just actually started heading back to the office again and that maybe we didn't learn a lesson uh, there and really change our thinking on how we work and how we communicate. Lorenzo, you first of all. I think a lot of people have changed. A lot of people want to keep the change. A lot of people have um, are taking more seriously um, what the what the pandemic is offering us in terms of making our jobs more sustainable, having a smaller, you know, like less negative impact on the climate. But we also have to understand that um, a lot of the the experiences that we have are for the, the privileged. You know, like there are a lot of people here in South Africa, for instance, that don't have the luxury of working from home. Uh, their livelihoods depend on what happens out there on the street, um, you know, small businesses, micro, uh, micro enterprises and so on and so forth. We have forgotten about that. I think also in this conversation, we've forgotten about the fact that the vaccination program is not working globally, that a lot of people in Africa are not vaccinated and they're not vaccinated, not because they don't want to get vaccinated, but because mm. the countries of the North, the rich countries have bought all the vaccines yeah. to vaccinate even people that don't need it yeah. because now they're vaccinating the, you know, like newborns and the babies when even the the medics, the medics in Africa are not vaccinated. Doctors are not vaccinated. Healthcare officials are not vaccinated, let alone the citizens. Yeah. So this is what I'm talking about when I say this pandemic has shown a lot of selfishness and it's self-defeating selfishness because at the end of the day, we're all suffering from new mutations and new variants coming from those countries where people haven't been vaccinated and who would have expected something totally different. And eventually the, the economy would benefit from it because if we were able to get rid of this, to turn it into an endemic, something that you can manage, we could go back to having a much better, you know, like economic trajectory and at the same time retain the good things we have learned during this past two years. Vicky, just quickly, and then Sajiro quickly as well, what's things like in London, Vicky? I know Boris Johnson has told people uh, to start working from home again, but before that, I mean, were they just heading back again? Uh, they suddenly were. Uh, the tubes were beginning, the underground was beginning to get quite full and, and people were relishing going out again and also meeting with their colleagues. So, But there was a bit of a hybrid situation that had developed. So most people would go into the office for just a few days a week. Mm. Quite a lot of working from home still happened. But just as Lorenzo is saying, it is a big, big issue because a number of people don't have that luxury, have not been able to do that. And what you found during the pandemic itself is that the higher you get paid, or you got paid, the more likely it was that the tasks that, that you were doing, there was a bigger share of those tasks you yeah. could do from home. The lower pay scale people either lost their jobs or had to go out and to still do face-to-face -face yeah. jobs, including sort of delivery, takeaways and what have you. So right. it has so, created a bit of inequality without any doubt. Sergio, 30 seconds with you. Uh, how's things there, going back to work or not? Well, we are, but, you know, I'd like to basically hope that this will continue in the sense that, you know, new methodology, new ideas, breaking the ice type of, you know, issues will continue because one of the problems that Japan have always had is sticking excessively to status quo. Yeah. So, you know, hybridization work, uh, I think, is certainly something that is welcomed and should be perpetuated from here onwards. Sajiro Takashita, Vicky Price, Lorenzo Fioramonti, thank you so much for your time and your thoughts today. Really appreciate it. And thank you as well for watching. There's always more online, aljazeera.com. You can visit us. You can catch up on any of our previous editions. Uh, you can head to facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story as well for more discussion. On Twitter, at AJ Inside Story. I'm at Kamal AJE uh, if you want to drop me a line. Thanks for joining us. I'm Kamal Santamaria from the whole Inside Story team. It's goodbye for now, and we'll see you again soon.